Reverend Shane is Senior Pastor at Emmanuel Evangelical Free Church, Emmanuel EFC. He has pastored the church for 18 years and counting, overseeing all its ministries. He was also adjunct lecturer at Singapore Bible College for a couple of years where he taught uh, Gospels and New Testament Greek. So Reverend Shane is married to his wife, Debbie. Together they have two children, Dylan and Caitlin. Today, he'll be speaking on the secret to contentment. The secret to contentment. Drawing from the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 10 to 20. Reverend Shane, please. It's, it's good to be back with you. I tell Pastor John, this is my annual pilgrimage to Calvary Chapel. I'm sorry that today my wife and kids are not here with me. Uh, for my kids now, both teenagers, being with their friends is more important than going with daddy. Let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the joy of coming together as your people to worship you, to remind ourselves of your goodness, your faithfulness, to encourage and spur one another on. And above all, Lord, to hear from you and what you have to say to us through your word. Thank you, Lord, that you are a God who communicates with your people, your heart, your desire, your plans, your will, your purposes. And thank you, Lord, that by your Holy Spirit, you can understand and hear. Pray that you give us the faith to also believe and obey that we may please you and honor you. For Jesus' sake. Amen. I think you will not disagree with me if I say we live in times of great financial insecurity. There is a worldwide cost of living crisis. Every nation is facing it to some degree or another. Inflation is skyrocketing. Singapore is having a core inflation rate that has soared to its highest in over 13 years. And on a very day-to-day -day practical basis, we all know how prices of everything keep rising. And to add to that, some of you know what it means to be retrenched or to lose your job. Others know what it means to live constantly in the uncertainty of not knowing whether you might be next. And I think for most of us, making ends meet is getting harder. Now, to, during times like these, we get very, very practical. And what do we do? We cut back on expenditure. And when we cut back on expenditure, often the first item that gets cut from our budgets is the support of God's work through the church. Now, the Christians in Philippi to whom Paul was writing uh, this letter were also experiencing financial difficulties. But the thing is, their difficulties had not stopped them from supporting Paul's ministry. If you look at chapter 10, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 10, 
he begins by saying, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. He, he, he is glad that even in the midst of their financial constraints and difficulties, they still showed their concern for his ministry and supported. And in the next 10 verses, he goes on to encourage them to continue to rely on, on God for their needs and to continue to give to God's work. Look at what he says in verses 11 to 13. Rely on God to meet your needs. Verse 11. He says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry. Whether living in plenty or in want. Now notice, in these, uh, in these three verses, twice he says, I have learned to be content. Verse 11, and then again in verse 12, I have learned the secret of being content. You see, even for Paul, contentment was something he had to learn. It didn't come naturally. It didn't come easily. He had learned it trial by trial, test by test, circumstance by circumstance. As he faced situations of need, learned to trust in God, and as he learned to trust in God and God supplied his need, he learned to be content. So contentment doesn't come to us naturally. It doesn't just happen. It has to be learned. Even Paul had to learn. But well, what is this contentment? What is contentment? Now in the New Testament, the Greek word for contentment can also be translated as satisfied or sufficient. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, when God told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Sufficient is the same word used here. My grace is sufficient for you. And so contentment is learning to be satisfied. Learning to be sufficient in what God provides. One Christian writer has defined contentment like this. Christian contentment is the God-given ability to be satisfied with the loving provision of God in any and every situation. And look at how Paul describes any and every situation. He says in verse 12, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of contentment, of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Look at the terminology he uses. He, he need in plenty. Well-fed or hungry, living in plenty or in want. Extremes, he emphasizes. Extremes in which he has experienced sufficient provision for his needs. And he does this to stress to the Philippine Christians that no matter how bleak the situation, God is able to meet their need. How does he know this? He knows it from his own personal experience. He had been stoned, he had been beaten and thrown into jail, he had faced hunger, thirst and cold. And now, as he writes, he is writing from a prison. He's writing from jail. And in the midst of all this, he says, I have learned to be content. And then he tells us the secret. He tells the Philippian Christians the secret and through them he tells us the secret in verse 13. 
I can do everything through him who gives me strength. That's the secret. His secret is his dependence on God. His secret was his total, utter reliance on God. I can do everything. But not in my strength. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And the him here is obviously God. So you see, the secret is not a set of circumstances. Sometimes we think, you know, if these things work out, if I get this job, if I, you know, my circumstances change and everything works out and my circumstances are good, then I can be content. But Paul is not talking about circumstances or contentment in a place. But he's talking of contentment in a person. The personhood of God. J.B. Phillips translates this verse very nicely. I want to show you two translations that I think bring this out quite nicely. One is J.B. Phillips that says, I am ready for anything through the strength of the one who lives within me. I am ready for anything through the strength of the one who lives in me. And then the Living Bible puts it this way. I can do everything God asks me to with the help of Christ who gives me the strength and power. Have you been in situations where you feel totally overwhelmed? And you know, you're, you, you're in your own strength, in your own ability, no way. And sometimes a sense of panic can come because you know you are not up to it. But then as you learn to trust God, depend on Him, look to Him, and He gives you the wisdom, the strength, the perseverance, the patience, the enablement. And then before you know it, you can look back and say, wow, I was able because God carried me through. And when you have that kind of experience, you know, your faith grows because the next challenge, the next situation, you know you can trust God again. The verb here, Paul says, I can do everything. I can do is in the Greek present tense, which is the same as the present continuous tense in English. I can keep on doing it. And it highlights Paul's continual, constant confidence in God, trust in God. Every day, every moment, I can. Not because I can, but because God can. And then look, there is no limit. He says, I can do everything. It's not some things, certain things, these things, but not those. I can do everything. Because there's nothing that God cannot do through me, in me, for me. And so Paul is saying, whatever the circumstances God leads him into, he is confident that through the enabling of God, he can do everything that needs to be done in those circumstances. In your own life, do you feel that God has led you into some circumstances where you are totally feeling overwhelmed, inadequate. And you know you cannot handle those circumstances by yourself. And sometimes you may be even questioning God and say, why, why are you leading me to this? Sometimes it, it, it could be because you have obeyed God and then you suddenly find yourself out of obedience in situations and circumstances that are beyond you. And so it's not because of sin or disobedience. Sometimes it's because of you walking in obedience. God has led you into circumstances that are more than you can bear. 
or carry or handle. And you may be questioning God as to why. God sometimes does that so that he can teach us to depend on him, to rely on him, and to experience the sufficiency that he can provide for us. And so Paul is saying, I have learned to be totally confident that I can cope with any and every situation through Jesus Christ. Because Christ's provision enables a believer to live in the place where God has put him or her and to be content. My wife and I are going through a tough uh, parenting patch with our daughter who is 14 years old. Uh, for the last two years, uh, she's been uh, on medication, seen a psychiatrist, um, battling depression and anxiety. She self-harms. She has suicidal ideation. We've um, had a couple of instances of she trying to overdose on medication, climbing out onto um, the ledge um, outside our corridor. Um, several hospitalizations, um, rush into ENE. And there are times when I sometimes look at other families who seem to have so called normal children. And I think, Lord, why I'm, I'm serving you, I, I have the pressures of ministry on, that I need to handle. Now on top of this, you are given me this, which is totally beyond my, my ability to handle the fear that grips me. It's sometimes overwhelming because I know as a human father, I cannot be there 24-7 to ensure the safety of my daughter. And then the Lord is now showing me how, you know, he's permitted this to teach me that as a father, human father, every time I'm at the end of my wits, I need to learn to trust him, to release my daughter to him, and to depend on him for the grace, the strength, the wisdom, the love, the patience that I need to unconditionally love my daughter in spite of what she says and does. And to remind myself that because Christ lives within me, I am adequate for the demands of parenting that I face. Hudson Taylor, the the great pioneer missionary to China, the founder of China Inland Mission, now overseas missionary fellowship, worked hard and felt that he was trusting Christ to meet his needs and the needs of the mission. Uh, but somehow he found he had no joy, he had no liberty in his ministry because it was burdensome. And then a letter from a friend opened his eyes to the adequacy of Jesus Christ. And he said this, I learned it is not by trusting my own faithfulness, but by looking away to the faithful one that I can have in work and serve with joy. It is not by trusting my own faithfulness, but by looking away to the faithful one. And this realization became the turning point in Hudson Taylor's life. Because from then on, he, he learned, like Paul, to moment by moment, day by day, to draw upon the power of Christ for every responsibility of the day. And Christ's power carried him through. Christ's power carried him through. 
I mean, there are days, you know, when I, 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 there are times when I, I cry out and say, Lord, I cannot. There's too much for me. You have put too much on my plate. And somehow, God gives the strength, the energy to push through, to pull through. And just like these Philippine Christians needed to, you and I need to learn to rely on God, to meet our needs, to give us the strength we need, to meet the challenges of every day. And God loves circumstances and situations to come into our lives to teach us this. It's a difficult lesson to learn because we human beings like to be independent, self-sufficient, self-reliant. And it's a very uneasy feeling to learn this and to remember and realize we are not self-sufficient. We, we cannot be self-reliant. Yet when you learn this lesson, it's a very freeing lesson because when you learn to be God-reliant and you experience God's faithfulness, dependability, it frees you. It frees you from worry. It frees you from anxiety. It frees you from fear. and just gives you the joy and the strength to live each day. And so Paul says, learn to rely on God. And then he says in verses 14 to 18, keep on giving to those in need. If you look at verses 14 to 16, he says, yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I'm looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied. Now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gift you sent. who tells us a few things about the giving of the Philippian Christians. First, they gave to support his ministry from the very first. They had become Christians. He says in verse 15, in the early days of their acquaintance with the gospel, they had supported him from their first exposure to the gospel. Second, we are told they were the only church to support him in his ministry. Again, verse 15, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. And thirdly, he says that they had given him aid more than once. Verse 16, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. And so Paul then encourages them to continue to keep giving. Why? They've already given him. Why the encouragement to continue to give? You see, okay, now these are a bit small, so... And I apologize for that. Uh, let me read it for you if, yeah, in case it's too small for you to read. And the first reason he encourages them to keep on giving is this. Giving brings blessings to the one who receives a gift. Now that may seem quite obvious, isn't it? I mean, you give to someone, you are blessing that person. Paul says in verse 18, I am amply supplied. Now that I have received from Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus, the gift you sent. But then look at what he says next. He says, not only is the person receiving the gift blessed, giving blesses God. He says, in verse 18, I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gift you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice. Pleasing to God. He talks of their giving as a fragrant offering, as a 
acceptable sacrifice to God. Now, the sacrifices of the Old Testament were intended as expressions of devotion to God. And here Paul is using that same terminology to describe the giving of the Philippian Christians. And he's telling them, every time you share, every time you sacrifice, God is pleased with your sacrifice. Your sacrifice of giving is a fragrant offering to God. Not that God needs our giving, but he pleases him. It's an offering, a sacrifice of devotion. And then he says something even more strange. Giving blesses the one who receives it. Giving blesses God, but giving brings blessings to the one who gives, the giver. He says in verse 17, not that I'm looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. Now, he's not promising that they will gain financially. Okay, now this, yeah, a lot of churches in a lot of places use this kind of terminology and say, oh, you give and God will give you even more and encourage people to give with the wrong motive in order that God might give more. He's not saying that, but he's saying that their sharing will be rewarded in heaven. Our heavenly account will be credited. Matthew 10, 42, Jesus said, if we share something as commonplace as a cup of water, we shall, under no circumstances, lose our reward. Luke chapter 12, verses 33 to 34. Uh, yeah, if you can't read the passage, it's Luke 12, 33 to 34. I'll read it for you. Jesus says, sell your positions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted. Where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So keep on giving. Sacrificially. It will bring blessing to the one who receives it. You will be blessing God. And you yourself will be blessed because of it. And that's true, isn't it? Giving brings a particular joy and blessing to the one who gives. Isn't it? And then after encouraging them to continue to give, Paul says, finally, as you give, continue to trust in God to provide for your needs. He says, verse 19, and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Look at that promise. It was personal. My God. My God will meet all your needs. Paul was alluding to his own experience of God's provision as a guarantee that God will meet their needs as well. Is he your God? Can you say, my God? And if you know him personally by believing in Jesus Christ, then you, like Paul, can say, my God, my God who is faithful, my God who is sufficient for my time of need. Because if you belong to him, he will take care of his own. And that's what he told his disciples, right? Look at the lilies of the field. How beautifully they are clothed. How much more valuable are you? Look at the birds in the air and how God feeds them. How much more are you valuable to Him? It was personal, it was inclusive. My God 
will supply, will meet some of your needs, certain of your needs. No, all your needs. Of course, it's important to remember that these are needs and not wants. He can and will meet every need of yours as you depend on and trust in him. And it was plentiful. All your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. You see, his glorious riches in Christ Jesus are not measurable. Are abundant. And you and I can never exhaust the grace and riches of God by our finite needs. Never. Because can the finite ever exhaust the infinite? Can man exhaust God? It is impossible. Isn't it? And so it's an amazing promise there. Often taken out of context. But here given to encourage those who were sacrificial in their response to the needs of God's word. Reminding us that God is committed to the seed, to the one who sacrificially gives to God's word. God is no man's debtor. And so the prospects are extremely bright for the person who shares and gives sacrificially. Because it means God is committed to looking after you and me. And his resources are abundant and manageable. And so when the child of God is in the will of God, serving for the glory of God, then he will have every need met. And contentment can be ours in the place where God has stationed us, in the circumstances in which God has put us. Whatever they may be, wherever that may be. Sometimes God allows difficult circumstances to teach us that contentment, that dependence. Because he wants us to know his sufficiency, his dependability. And by knowing that, to experience the joy. You know, Paul's uh, theme in, in, in Philippians, the book is Rejoice in the Lord Always. You might wonder, how can you rejoice in the Lord always? This is a secret. This is a secret. And so, to uh, Paul, it was not a matter of great concern if he had things or didn't have them. He held on to things very lightly. And he had learned that secret of contentment. So I'd like to close by just helping you, helping myself to ask some questions. Now again, um, I realize these are very small, uh, but uh, I have given the PowerPoint uh, slides. So if you yeah, like to have them, please tell Pastor John and I'm sure the church can provide them for you. Ask yourself, is there anything that I want more of? Uh, uh, a simple question. Nothing, nothing wrong. But here's an important thing to then consider. If yes, if there is something I want more of, does that desire keep me from being content? Secondly, am I satisfied with where I am now? What are the good things about where I am now? 
because everywhere, wherever we are, there are positive things, there are good things. And it's sometimes good to uh, count your blessings. If I do not have as much as others, do I feel intimidated by them? Or perhaps even somewhat jealous deep down? There are times I feel a little bit intimidated and jealous when I meet up with my, my junior college batchmates who are all doing very well uh, in, in the marketplace. And uh, yeah, um, sometimes I, you know, those, those sudden thoughts, you know, have I missed out because I'm in full-time vocational ministry. And then here's the important thing also to consider. Do I know where my money is going? Do I have a budget in order to be a good steward of God's gifts to me? Do I have a definite system in making sure I'm giving proportionately and regularly to the Lord's will? Okay, these are things uh, yeah, we need to put in place. And then here's, I think, a key one for us living in Singapore. Are there ways to simplify your lifestyle so that you can live on less and give more? It's not something we normally think about too much in Singapore. And to help us with this, uh, I can recommend a very, very good book, uh, Richard Foster, Celebration of Discipline. You may have already read it. You may have the book if you haven't had it or read it. Uh, it's, it's a worthwhile read. Richard Foster, Celebration of Discipline. And uh, he, he says a few uh, good, he gives us a few good tips in that book. He says, buy things for their usefulness rather than their status. Reject anything that is producing an addiction in you. It can be good things. Okay. Um, for me, at one stage, it was books. Uh, but anything, even good things that produce an addiction is not a good thing. Develop a habit of giving things away. De-accumulate. I think most of us could get rid of many of our possessions without any serious sacrifice, okay? And, and yeah, there are many things in our homes that learn to enjoy things without having to own them. Owning things is an obsession in our culture. And yet many things in life can be enjoyed without having to possess them. I am trying to teach this to my daughter. She, she loves books. And for her, she loves books. She wants to have them and arrange them on her bookshelf. Just you know, gaze at all the books and the covers. And, and so she has this collection. I do buy her books, but I'm also trying to tell her, you don't need to buy every book you want to read. The library is there. But she says, there'll be something. Saying, when I have it, I can arrange it. Look at it and feel good. And that's uh, part of, I think, what we uh, Richard Foster also says. He says, don't do impulse buying. Uh, that's why they say when you're hungry, don't go to the supermarket to do your marketing. You know what I mean, right? And then train your children. Our culture is training our children to desire everything they see. And we do, the, do them no favor when we give in to their everything. Give them what they need. And train them to know the difference between need and want. I'd like to end with just this quotation from 1 Timothy. Chapter 6, verses 6 to 11. Again, I apologize. It's, it's too small for you to read. It's not your eyesight. Uh, but, yeah. You can take note of this 
uh, these verses where Paul tells Timothy, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Let us pray. Lord, sometimes we who live in this modern world and in Singapore today, probably find it hard to agree with Paul when he says, if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. And yet those are the very two items that you talked to your disciples about. And you showed them the lilies of the field and how beautifully they are clothed. When you pointed out the birds of the air and how, how well they are fed. And then you told your disciples, seek first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Lord, thank you, Lord. Would you remind me? Would you remind each of us? That you are a good God who is able to take care of his children. And all you ask of us is to trust him. To depend on him. And yet, Lord, so often we fail to do that. And we worry and we are anxious and we fear for them. And all of it robs us of the joy of the Lord and the peace that you so desire for us to have each day. And as we come to the end of another year and anticipate a year, another year of uncertainty, Lord, teach us Teach us that we only need to trust and rest in you. Because you are more than able to provide for us, to carry us, to strengthen us, to give us the enabling for every challenge, every circumstance. And you may love to come your way. And I pray, Lord, even when times, when things become overwhelming, lead us to the rock that is higher than I. Lead us to the rock that is firm. Lead us to the rock that will never fail us. And through each circumstance, through each situation, help us to learn. Learn contentment. 
learn and rest in you. And by that to be able to rejoice always. And we ask this in Jesus' name.